Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship here this morning. And we have a number of things to cover. Uh, first of all, I'm going to turn the floor over to Wanda Rockenball. And she's going to talk to us about what's on her mind. Hopefully, <laughs> the top of my head. But... I've got a short little story I want to read to you today, and then I've got a challenge for you. This one's called Not Quite Empty. My son Roy loves to help people and he has a real heart for children. I appreciated his willingness to represent me in Central America. He and his wife Donna traveled to Panama for a shoebox distribution in January of 2002. Once in the country, they boarded a premier plane and flew to the little town of David, which is pronounced David, where they did a series of shoebox distributions. Before the team unloaded the boxes for their last distribution of the day, Roy led the team in prayer, asking that the boxes would be guided to the right children and asking that there would be enough gifts to go around. Well, the children were all excited that the gifts were handed out, but Roy began to feel a little uneasy when there appeared to be more children waiting for boxes than there was boxes stacked up. Sure enough, they were 14 boxes short for 10 to 15 year olds. Roy said, all I could think about was watching the boys walk away empty handed while all the other children were jumping for joy. We had prayed this wouldn't happen. The team began clearing things out as the distribution came to a close. And while someone wrote down the boys names that were leaving without a gift. Roy began giving empty cardboard cartons that shoebox that had shipped in to mothers to use for sleeping mats in their grass huts. But when Roy picked up the last carton to give it away, it wasn't empty. He found exactly 14 shoeboxes for the correct age and gender. Roy, who loves helping people, was thrilled to put those shoeboxes into the boys' hands knowing that the Lord had answered their prayer. And there again, God works in mysterious ways. Those 14 boxes somehow appear. And what I'd like to do um, today is give you all a challenge. I'm going to give you a simple thing to do this week and bring it in next week. I want you to go out and purchase one tube of toothpaste and a child's toothbrush, soft bristle. And bring it in next Sunday if you're up to the challenge of doing that much. A tube of toothpaste and one child's soft bristle toothbrush. How many is up for it? Okay. We'll have a box out back, but I'd like you to bring it in. Don't put it in the box yet. I want you to actually bring it in. And I'm going to show you how simple filling a shoe box can really be and how much fun it can be. So I thank you all again and have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. You're welcome. Okay, there are a number of other items I would like to call to your attention. Uh, first of all, uh, the pastor's Bible study begins tomorrow, uh, September the 25th at 6.30 p.m. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about that? I'll say it later. Okay. Uh, and the, a OLFS meeting is, to, is uh, the 27th at 7 p.m. Um, and the OLFS will be participating in the OLFS again this year on Saturday, September 30th uh, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. We're looking for donations of soda and bottled water. The first shop would appreciate your considering to volunteer during the week or on Saturdays. Volunteers are needed for September 30th, which is OLFS, and for the months of October, November, and December. If you'd like to volunteer, please contact Michelle Bean, uh, and the number is, in, is, in, is listed in your bulletin. During the month of September, please consider making a donation to UMCOR. They are currently working with disaster coordinators and early response teams to provide relief to the many victims of the hurricanes, tropical storms, and earthquakes that we've been having recently. Please encourage your family and friends to also make donations. 
for more information and to contribute, see the special Humpcore flyer envelope in the North X. Please make your check donations payable to Trinity. We will be sending a church check to Humpcore in October. Uh, that pretty much covers uh, that's the important items, I guess, in the uh, bulletin, although they all are, are important, and you should take it with you uh, and read it at home and post it on your refrigerator as a reminder of uh, the things that uh, are, are happening in the life of our church um, and which uh, you might uh, find it uh, beneficial to participate in. I believe that concludes the announcements and in um, recognizing that, I would just simply like to say that we are glad that you are here and with the peace of Christ be with you. And, also with you. and will you please pass the peace with your neighbor who is nearby.
sins of our thoughts, words, or deeds in silent prayer before God. Somewhat in there, like you know, in that pool, and but it wasn't 
fit to drink. So God heard him complain. Oh, if you're going to complain, complain to God because God's the one who can do something about it. So what God was, God did, God told Moses, God's man down there, God told Moses, Moses, see those sticks, throw those sticks in the water. And he did, and guess what? The water became, they said, it's sweet water. And in that moment, guess what? God invented ginger ale. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. And it was <laughs> it's, it's, it's ancient. I don't know. And they even knew there was going to be a Canada. It was called Canada Dry Ginger Ale. And God invented that for the people. And then Guess what happened after that? They went a little further and there was nothing to eat. There is nothing to eat out here. And they complained, you were complaining too, there is nothing to eat. But guess what? They complained to God. And God said, okay, nothing to eat. I will send you something to eat. And you know what he sent? Well, he sent some things that look like crackers. Have a cracker. Hey, but wait, not yet. Not only was it like a cracker, but it was cracker with a little bit of honey, just as sweet as could be. Would you like honey on your cracker? Yeah. And and they said, and they said in Hebrew, turn it over and work better. There you go. Don't let it spill in your clothes because I don't want to talk to your moms about it. <laughs> They'll go ahead and eat it. And they said, what is that? Except in Hebrew, when you say what is that, you know what it is? Mana. Mana. And so God said, that's it. It's mana. It's bread. They complained to God and they got bread. Not just any old bread, but bread with honey. And then they said, that's still not enough to eat. So guess what God did? God said, I hear you complaining. So guess what? He sent them chickens. Although they didn't call them chickens, they called them quail. And these quail flew down and they had quail to eat. Just like this, only theirs probably wasn't frozen, it was probably fresh, but it was there. And then, they still weren't happy. Two weeks later, they're complaining again about no water, no water. But again, they complained to who? They complained to God. And so God sends water. Yeah, he told Moses, go ahead and strike that rock. It wasn't a rock, it was a soda machine. Guess what? Water. It was a soda machine, it wasn't my water. Well, it was a it was a it was a water machine. And he hit it with his stick and water came out. And not for everybody. So look, here is who God is. God is a soda can. Invents wonderful things for us to drink, like ginger ale. God invents wonderful things for us to eat, like crackers and honey. God sends us wonderful things, like a Cornish ham. You know, those little chickens. Yeah. I was going to open it, but they're really messy when they first take them out, right? And, and but that, that they came right down, those quail, and they ate them, and water. For everybody to drink. This is God sending us all this good stuff. And God says, You know why I send you this? I send you this so you know I love you. Quail came raining down, and everyone was holding up a blessing towards the rose of those falling quail. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And when they all finished, you know what they did? They said, Let's say grace. Thank you, God, for all our food. Y'all have a grace? Do you have one? I put a grace on a board out front. I don't know if you saw it. God is great. God is good. Thank you for this. You can. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say that for us? Sure. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. See you later. Uh -huh. For a while, because it fits right into the sermon for the morning, and uh, they'll be ready for us. 
It is a good day. Amen? Amen. I mean, this could be June, <laughs> not September. A wonderful day like this, and we rejoice in that. It makes our hearts glad, and God gives us this kind of a day. So we have that for which we would give our thanks today, and we join our prayers in order to rejoice before the Lord. And we pray also, some might call it complaining, you know? Lord, why does this, why does that? But we'll call it uh, supplication. We'll call it uh, prayers of petition that we'd ask the Lord to come and share blessings of God's mercy and grace upon those whom we name. We do rejoice today in having Henrietta with us. It's a special day, and we're happy that you're here. And we know that you have still some healing to accomplish, but it means a lot that you're here with us on this day. I think I saw Robin, I did, and Robin, it is good to have you here today, and our prayers continue with you on the loss of your mom, and I would remind everybody that the service for Shirley is on Tuesday at the Slack Funeral Home at 1 o'clock, preceded by a visitation time that begins at noon, uh, and then there will be a reception and luncheon here following the uh, interment. So we keep prayers on Robin praying for Henrietta, and look to God's grace and mercy. Others, other things for which we may give our thanks for which we would pray. To give thanks for the workers for uh, yesterday's Amen. affair, because yeah. they worked long and hard, and they didn't be here until well after 8 o'clock. Yeah. So we were, I couldn't join them for that, so I am thankful that they were here to do that. Yeah. And my um, granddaughter asked, can we pray for my uncle's family? <laughs> And I said, yes, we surely can. But she lost her, Bill lost his brother this week, last um, Sunday. Um, last Sunday, he had a heart attack. Um, he was 55. Um, and so he needs a wife and a daughter. Um, so I promised Sophie that we would all pray, pray for, for mom and daughter. Okay, all right. Let's keep them in our prayers. In our prayers. Sophie's family. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Keep them in prayer. Others. Well, it's good to have Lee back. We give thanks for Lee's return from his sojourn in Alaska. It's always good to have the treasure back on the property. We <laughs> <laughs> pay the bills. <laughs> uh, let's right. pray for those in Mexico. They've had another earthquake again. Three earthquakes in Mexico, just one after another. Let us keep those folks in prayer. And our friends in Puerto Rico. Oh, devastation of a whole island. Keep those folks in prayer as well. Amen? Amen. All right. Let us look then to the Lord in prayer. God, on this day, on this day, on this Sunday, we woke to see the glory of your sunshine and it became so clear to us your goodness, your mercy, your providence, just beaming all around us. Lord, help us to drink that in. Because not every day begins this good. We just need to know on this day that the signs of your love are all about us. Help us, Lord, just to drink that in and to be so filled with thankfulness for your goodness and so filled with the brightness of your love that it may empower us to live lives that are pleasing in your sight and that we have that within us of you that we can share with others. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Ah, for the teamwork that it took to do the meal and have the wonderful time yesterday that we had in our fellowship hall. All around the plate of spaghetti. It was a great time, Lord. We give you thanks. We, we worship you, Lord, in order that we may be your people and learn from you how we can work together. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, for those uh, who are here gathered this morning and pray your blessing upon each of us. We pray that you might be with uh, Sophie's family as uh, they gather themselves and, and seek to find strength and comfort in this time. We pray that you will be there. Be with Robin, Lord, and her family on the loss of her mom, that it may be well with them and your presence be abounding with them, just filling their lives and letting your love light their way look to you, Lord, for each of us, that we may feel your strength come into our lives, that we may know your goodness as a part of our being, 
that we may have that vision that you give us in Jesus of what life can be that just keeps calling us forward, keeps calling us forward. And you light our step, one step at a time, and you fill our hearts one day at a time with your love, your goodness, your mercy. We ask it in Jesus' name and, talk, and pray as he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Which is, uh, shout the victory, Christ is King. You're not going to hear this morning. It's a new one. It's a terrific song. We worked a lot on it, and if we'd have had five more minutes. But everybody decided, well, at least most of the quartet felt like they'd rather hold it up until it's perfect. So Amen. you'll see it in another week or two. All right. So we're going to sing Victory in Jesus. Two of the verses.
The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. <clears throat> then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. Be to God. We turn now to the New Testament reading, and it comes from the book of Philippians. However, the theme is the same as was in the book of Exodus. That is God moving us on. It, we, we, don't need, we won't stand for, the, for this reading. I'm sorry. Because I'm going to go right from this reading into the sermon. And you don't want to stand for the sermon. It would take too long. <laughs> so I'm going to stand for this. Um, you'll notice, if I can say in a word of introduction to the scripture, you'll notice that the gift of bread, the manna, um, comes with a word of uh, instruction. And the instruction is, there's a right way to eat this. So that God can lead them through the gift of bread into the right way of living. We'll talk more about that. Paul in Philippians picks up this same theme of saying, the gift of God to us is the living bread in Christ. But with that gift comes instructions of the right way to live it. Listen to what he has to say in these verses from the second chapter of Philippians. He says, um, even though all of them were seeking, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong, in the wrong place. It's from the first chapter um, of Philippians. Beginning with the 21st verse, he says, for me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And then I don't know which I prefer. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain here in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain. 
and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only, only, he says, live your life in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but for your salvation. And this is God's doing. For God graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for Him as well since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have with you. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. And we give thanks to God for that word. Amen. So a word this morning um, takes us from um, the, the desert of Sinai to the city of Philippi, uh, and it, uh, it takes a span of over 2,000 years. But notice the theme remains the same, and I think it's really important to pick this up. While it is that the gift of water, oh, and more importantly, the gift of the manna, the, the bread from heaven, um, which turned out to be probably a very much a natural substance. It said that the tamarisk tree that grew in the region where they were wandering, those people of Israel, um, had a kind of a sap that came upon it in the morning, and if you harvested it properly, um, it would produce quite a nice uh, taste, and, uh, and, and, and you could survive on that. And as a matter of fact, the people did survive on that because they had that manna for 40 years as they walk through the wilderness. But note that it comes with um, instructions. Do any of you read the instructions? Then you get them. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes um, when I first started um, um, making breakfast, I would read the instructions on the Aunt Jemima box. And I wanted to do it right, right? You have a cup of this, you have a cup of that, and eggs, some of this, some of that. And then somebody told me, just make it. Just put it all in there and stir it up. Oh, no, no, no. It won't be right if you don't do it right. Well, God is like that with the manna. It won't be right if you don't do it right. Now, you remember what the instructions were on the manna? What were they? Enough for one day, right? Enough for one day. Don't go storing a bunch of it up in your garage because that's not the way you do it. And besides, if you do, it'll be full of worms the next day. Give us this day our daily bread. Depend on the Lord's providence one day at a time. It'll be all right. And everybody will have enough. It's not like Michelle will get a whole lot because she gets out there first and gathers it all up. And then poor old Stan only gets a little thimbleful. No, 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 no. There'll be enough for everybody's need. You see what I mean? There'll be enough for everybody. Just be satisfied with that. No, it'll be good. Oh, oh, but wait, there's a third instruction. Remember what it was? Two days. You can't gather it up on the Sabbath. This is, this is, this is a long time before you get the Ten Commandments where it says, remember Sabbath day, keep it holy. But already, God is prepping the people for that because God has decided that it is good for us to rest. One day, sit down, stop working, and just know that the Lord is good. So on the day before the Sabbath, you got to gather enough for two days, right? And then you'll have that for the next day. You won't have to go out and work that up. You know, you make enough pancakes on Friday. It'll carry it through Saturday. And it'll be okay. We just rest. But that was the thing. If you eat this food in the right way, you will learn the right thing 
from God that you might live in the right way. I often wonder, don't you, why God puts up with all the complaining in the book of Exodus. Well, and if you wonder that, you could wonder why God puts up with all the stuff that he does with us, even now. Why do you think God put up with all their complaining? Because the recurring phrase throughout that 16th chapter of Exodus is, and God hearkened to their complaining. God, God's ear was attuned to their complaining. And he never said, honey, oh, these people complain so much. God simply responds to that. Why? I think two reasons. One, God needed to keep the people going in their walk through the wilderness so that they could get to the promised land. If God didn't give them food and water, they all died. The cause is finished. See? The cause is finished. I don't know that God planned a route out so there'd be an oasis here and a Coke machine there, you know, and falling quail over here. But God had this vision that this people could walk through the wilderness and while they wandered, they could get closer to each other. They could become something special to each other. I think we missed something. I think Friday should have been a religious holiday. I mean, it was for the Jews, it's Rosh Hashanah. But I think on Friday, you know, Friday was the first day of autumn, right? The autumn vernal equinox. Do you know what happens on that day? All the leaves start falling off the trees. Now, what well, does? But you know what it is on that day? Equal sunshine in the dark. Yeah. It's the day of perfect balance. The same amount of darkness as there is light. And who decides when it gets dark? That's what I want to know. I was out on my bike the other day and I got caught in the darkness. And there is a time when there's light and there's a time when there's darkness. And you can't see the holes in the road and you really get bounced around. Who decides when that ends and the other begins? I don't know, but whoever did, you know that on Friday, it was 12 hours of light, 12 hours of perfect balance. See, I think we ought to celebrate that, that it's possible to have balance in existence. You know, not some things, some people have a whole lot, other people have nothing. No, it's possible to have balance. It's possible to have harmony between folks. It's good to have that harmony. And all of that is seen on that Friday. I think we should have come to church and celebrated. Thank you, God, for this example, that there can be balance and harmony. Well, God's trying to work that out with his people. And he said, the only way you're going to get that is if you listen to me. And the only way you're going to learn that is if I connect it with bread, right? I know, I know. If my dad did the same thing. If you don't have these certain chores done, you go to bed without supper. I heard it all the time. And I never wanted to go to bed without supper, so I always did the chores. And God works the same way with God's people. But God didn't want to just get them into that land, but he wanted them to get there knowing something. See, God had a vision. And you see that vision laid out again and again in Scripture. Ah, oh, there's three or four places where you read it in Isaiah. You know those places. Like in the 11th chapter, where he talks about how the lion and the lamb should lie down together, and you won't call each other names. That's not in there. I just added that. But I think we don't need to do that kind of stuff. And the calf and the lion, they'll all be together, and they won't hurt or destroy on the holy mountain. God wants to create that. God wants to create that. In the 35th chapter, he says, Want that kind of society that when the poor and needy cry out for water, there'll be those who will give it to them. Ah, just like God did in the wilderness. We're supposed to create a society where it's like that for everybody. And then on into the 41st chapter, it talks about how he can bring people together so they share that goodness. And then in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, the 47th chapter, 
Read that sometime. That's the best thing of all. He says, there'll be this water that flows out of the temple up in Jerusalem. And it'll come down the hill and it'll flow into the Dead Sea, which is absolutely devoid of life. But when that water gets there, there'll be fish in the sea. There'll be flowers blooming. There'll be trees giving out fruit. And it will be wonderful for all people to enjoy. God has his vision and his brain and his mind and his heart about how life can be. And all he's trying to do is keep these people moving in that direction. So when they get to the promised land, hey, they won't just sit there and drink the milk and eat the honey, but they'll live the kind of society that God wants them to live that will allow them to be a light to everybody. This is the way we're supposed to live. So the project continues. Jesus picks it up. And one of some of the main things that Jesus does well, he feeds people, right? Not because he thinks that that'll get everybody's attention, but because that's what God does and that's what God wants us to do. And he brings these people together around food. And I think he, he, he kind of gets them organized, you know? It said that when, when there were 5,000 people to eat, Jesus got them groups in groups of 500. Boom, boom, boom. And then he had his disciples go and he could, he could serve them so that everybody would get something to eat. But also so that they could realize that what's really good is to order ourselves in such a way that we know how to work together. Now St. Paul saw this. St. Paul saw this so that when he wrote to the Philippians, and the Philippians were like a lot of churches. They were kind of struggling to know how to do things together. Some were getting ahead of the others. Some were insisting so hard on their way that the others couldn't keep them happy. And they were struggling in that regard. So St. Paul writes to them. And he says, look, here's the main thing you need to know. That we're not just sitting here. We're on our way to somewhere. We're not just coming in church and sitting here and enduring yet another long sermon, but we're in here for a reason. That is that God wants to take us somewhere. God wants us to come in here and worship God so that some of what is God can flow into us. And God then can use that to move us in the direction he wants us to go. He said, to the people of Philippi, well, he didn't say this, but you could say it this way. Coming and sitting in church does no more make you a Christian than sitting in your garage would make you a car. Okay? You have to live a life worthy of your calling, he said. You have to live like the one you believe in, he said. You have to live like Christ. In fact, what did Paul say? For me to live is Christ. And in the second chapter of Philippians, he just, I don't know why I'm holding my glasses, I don't have anything to read. <laughs> um, in the second chapter of Philippians, he said, this is what Christ's life is like. He laid aside everything was, which could have been his selfish requirements, laid aside his divinity, laid aside all his specialness, and he became like us, became a human being, took the form of a servant and became the servant of us all. So that just like on the eternal, not eternal, um, equinox day, the vernal equinox day, we can see balance. So in Christ, we can see what our life is supposed to be like. And he said, let that mind be in us, which is in Christ Jesus. That way, he says, if we consider each of ourselves a a servant to the other, we will stand arm in arm. And when we stand arm in arm, we'll be able to do good things in the name of the Lord. If we don't stand arm in arm, all our good gets to be a fraud. It is. If you can't do it in love, you can't do it in the name of Christ. And if you don't do it in Christ, it's not worth doing, right? So he said, let that spirit be in you so that we stand firm together. He said, remember this. Your citizenship is in the kingdom of God. He said, you're citizens of the kingdom. See, Paul thought 
that there was not just this business on earth, but there is a commonwealth in heaven, a place where the vision of God is fulfilled. And from that commonwealth was sent Jesus to us to show us how to live so that we can be a part of that commonwealth. And our job is to follow that as closely as we can in order that we may live, as Paul says, a life worthy of our calling for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we have that job in our church here at Trinity, don't we? Our, our task here is to live our life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we seek to do that. Meaning that it's not only what we do, but it's how we do it. It's not only where we go, but how we get there. I believe that God has in God's vision, a vision for us. I believe that God is, is calling us to move into another stage of our living here at Trinity. Now, part of that has to do with something we'll work on today about rethinking our Sunday schedule so that it is the best it can be. Not just so that you and you and you and me can get here at the time we want to get here, but so that it be a time when we can worship together, when we can have Sunday school together, where our children will have time for their Sunday school, and where we will have time for our fellowship, because that is very important too. It's that that brings us together on these time periods. And so that the unrepresented person will have a voice in our decisions too. Perhaps that un uh, unrepresented person is the person that's living out there in one of the houses around us who needs to come here and to be a part of this community. And one of our questions has got to be as we rethink our Sunday morning schedule, what would be the best time to tell that person it's time to come here? Because see, when we get this, uh, when we get this schedule reset, we're going to make a big deal of it. Oh, yeah. We're going to tell as many people as we can. We'll leaflet the neighborhood. We'll put up big signs. We'll celebrate. This is how we are at Trinity now. Boom, 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 boom. And our hope is that somebody who reads that sign will say, I've been wanting to go there, and that's just the time I can make it. You know, give me time, da, 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 da. What's that time? We've got to keep thinking about that as well as what it is that we want in terms of our time, you see. But let me tell you something. What is important is this. It's not as important to decide on a particular time as to do it in the attitude of Christ, as to do it in a life worthy of our calling, as to do it in a way that links our arms side by side and to say, Lord, we have thought through this thing. We have prayed about this thing. And together, and together, we think this is the best we can do. Guide us, protect us, and show us the way. And then, Lord, help us to live through that. In order not only that our worship can be brightened, our education can grow in you, our fellowship be nourished in you, but that we can present you, Lord, in our fellowship, in our community, in our Trinity United Methodist Church, to the people of our community. And folks will start showing up, fill in some of the empty places in our pews find themselves caught up in the love of Christ because they find it here. Yesterday, I, I had a little time in the afternoon and I rode out one of my favorite bicycle journeys. And, and, and you go out Route 99, you know 99 goes through West Friendship, and you cross 32 and you just keep going. And, and you think, oh, where in the world is this thing going? And you go through these farms. And you go up this hill, and there's this really charming farm right around this turn right there. Except somebody's going to start building houses on it. Uh, and then you go down the, through these woods, and then you come upon this most wonderful valley, which just opens before you. There's nothing going on there. Oh, somebody's growing soybeans on this side. They're coming along very nicely. So on this side, it's mostly just weeds and old trees. But it's just as peaceful as can be. And I just love going out there. I just love going out there. It's a little bit of an uphill leaving it, um, which expresses my regret for having to go. But it just fills me with hope and joy just to be there. And I always
always hope that a church is like that. That to go through a lot of rough times through the week. You didn't come to a community that's just full of the peace of Christ. I think that's why we passed the peace at the beginning. Just to say to each other, the peace of Christ is here. No, this is a peaceful valley that you can come into and feel your life restored and re-energized by the presence of God. Oh, Lord, you've led us this far. Now, lead us forward. You've showed us how to live. Now, show us some more. You've brought us to this point in our journey, and now take us a little bit further. Oh, Lord, help us to be your commonwealth on earth. Oh, Lord, help us to be this outpost for the kingdom of God right here at Trinity. Oh, Lord, help us to be your people, worshiping you, being nurtured in you, sharing fellowship in you, and reaching out to the world, to this community, in your name. We ask and beseech this in Jesus' name. Will you stand, please, and turn to number 885 in the hymnal for the affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God
Will you sing just the first and last verses of this hymn? Giving us peace and love and joy for this day and for every day. 